Okay, Happy New Year, everyone. I'd like to call tonight's regular meeting in order. Recommendation that the agenda for the regular council meeting of January 11th, 2016, be adopted as presented. Moved by Councilor Cunningham, seconded by Councilor Nish. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Item 3A, recommendation that the minutes of the special council meeting of December 2nd, 2015 be adopted. Moved by Councilor Kinney, second by Councilor Renhawa. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. 3B, recommendation that the minutes of the special council meeting of December 7th, 2015 be adopted. Moved by Councilor Morrow, seconded by Councilor Nish. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Item 3C, recommendation that the minutes of the regular council meeting of December 7th, 2015 be adopted. Moved by Councilor Kinney, second by Councilor Cunningham. All those in favor? Motion's carried. And item 3D, recommendation that the minutes of the public hearing uh, meeting of December 7th, 2015 be adopted. Moved by Councilor Renhawa, seconded by Councilor Morrow. All those in favor? Motion's carried. You forgot B. Pardon? You forgot B. No, nope, I got the meeting for the December 7th special meeting. Yeah. yeah no, we, we got that. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, first up we have a presentation by City Planner Zeno Krekic regarding the uh, planning for major projects. Welcome, Mr. Krekic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just notice the screen is not down. It's going to take a few seconds for it to... Uh, come up, become live. So, uh, here it is. <coughs> so, planning for major projects. Um, maybe just a quick explanation on, as to what that is. So general expectations of a large uh, temporal population, but we always kind of draw a curve, is not something that has been contemplated in our regulatory tools that we have to our, to our use, which are official community plans, only plan, plan development permit areas and such. Um, and so I have to kind of make a distinction between the two. And I call, I call the official community plan the zoning bylaw and those tools as core planning, just reference to being the integral part. It's a central part of our planning that we must that we must do. Um, and then PMT, PMP, or planning for major project, is an attempt to to uh, project and forecast how the uh, sudden and abrupt population entrance and exit will affect the community, and essentially how can we plan so that when we come to the end of the project and lost construction workers leave, um, that we still have the community. Uh, many of us spent a, a weekend in, in a workshop on place making. You know, how activities of that nature, which create a community, can continue and be successful throughout and after uh, this big population um, explosion takes place. So that's generally what it is. Uh, quickly, introduction. We started up in 2013, uh, largely by um, by a lot of uh, support from 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 our CAO. Um, 2014 was resembled a hurry up and wait. However, we did uh, meet some important benchmarks. Uh, the housing inventory is a uh, is not unique, but definitely not something that's done um, as a matter of course. And what was really interesting is that although we did hire out technical support, um, probably 75% of the work was done by city staff. And that included clerks and building inspectors. And it was interesting to see um, how our, our conclusion that city of Prince Rupert has um, multi-generational presence translated into um, individuals taking initiative to be part of this of this work and 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 being quite proud of it at the end we also entered into a GIS which is a geographic information systems it's a powerful uh, computer program which combines data and mapping and uh, we were able to to uh, get some money from the 
provincial government, and that was also a fairly big part of 2014. If 2014 was hurry up and wait, 2015 was all about hurry up. There was absolutely no wait whatsoever. Uh, indicators. Indicators are, are those things that are important to the community. Now you see that I provided links all along the way. I'm not going to be opening up at each link. It's a continuous reminder to council and, and to the community that pretty well everything that we do, we do post on the website, which can be found under the projects and planning for major projects. Um, this one I will open. It's an important link, I mean, important um, document which is not opening. Uh, it opened up down here. Uh, so indicators this, you can see by the date that this was done um, nearly two years ago. Um, on the left hand side indicators are those things that we through a number of uh, um, meetings and, and sessions uh, identified as being important things. Uh, to the community, uh, they include population, housing, land base, health, uh, land base, infrastructure, uh, social capital, tax base, local commerce, education, and health. Uh, some of these things belong to the uh, to the city responsibilities, and some are not. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, this definitely has outlived its, uh, its, its life cycle. As you can see, the measurements and such, many of them have been done, and, and we have confirmed as to why we are doing it, which is part of the analysis. And I think uh, that our communications manager has created some, has created some, some infographics that I will share with you. I think this can be now turned into in infographic to be more descriptive and, and readable for the community residents in general. Uh, we also entered into community engagement. Uh, yeah, we, we have, this year we really concentrated on, on, on keeping council abreast. And, and so we had a number of workshops and tried to keep the council uh, aware and we were moving very fast. So there was no very much time to catch up. It was all about uh, present time and, and, and kind of understanding where we are. And so uh, this, this one uh, PDF, um, this is, this is what our communications manager um, has created as a first of a series of PDFs. This was already in a social media, on a Facebook and Twitter, and on our, and on our website. We had a mild success in, in, in people looking at it. Uh, we're also going to put this in the newspapers. But the, the, re there is, the reason for this one is to, number one, talk about what are city responsibilities and which responsibilities are not city res responsibilities. And kind of clearly indicate that some things like, for example, nonprofit housing um, or non-market housing is a, it's a very much a provincial matter that, that we cannot address, but we can, we can definitely help along with it. Um, <clears throat> Population indicators, sub-descriptive, probably one of the most important uh, indicators. Uh, generally, across the Canada, across British Columbia, every municipality does any planning, uh, starts with Stats Canada. Stats Canada numbers are the ones that govern everything. And then from there on, we, we, go, we go into a variety of analysis. We have found out that on a continuous basis that, that the numbers that Stats Canada has uh, published are did not we did not think anecdote based on anecdotal evidence that uh, that they are correct that they were always less than what was indicated and so you know after a long period of time we finally this year conducted our own survey which was scientifically which was scientifically um, uh, uh, done uh, we had a economist and and statisticians who who led us through the systems of questionnaires and, and such, and, and we did a sample that's of adequate size to, to, to assure that we have accuracy. And essentially, we have found out that uh, what we anecdotally thought was correct, it was correct. And so while Canada pegs us at approximately 12,500 in 2011, 
and DC stats adjusted it to below 12,000. For 2014, our numbers were just less than 14,000. So if we are looking at a difference of 10 to 15 percent, those who are in a planning profession know that that's a noticeable number that we should be mindful of. And so that was the reason for us to do it, and it's a very important number to, to consider. Uh, we also uh, stumbled upon something that we really were not aiming to do. It's on a project team. Uh, we've, we have a biologist, uh, uh, Brad Pollard, from, from Terrace. And um, um, one afternoon when we, when we were really stuck and we were really not productive on, on shadow population projections, uh, he um, helped us by um, applying his uh, his uh, experience and knowledge in uh, in the in the wildlife uh, surveys and we should done for environmental assessment report and use some of the methodo methodology that he used there to start us off and so now uh, those who were on uh, October 20th uh, public uh, uh, council council um, workshop have seen this much shorter version essentially it was just the top end and the bottom end. We have expanded it drastically. Uh, we are now at version 9, and in fact, uh, Brad is working on version 10 already. What we have done is we have subdivided the population to craft, non-craft. This is the, the population that will come with, with the major projects. We have subdivided them in a craft, non-craft, and management. This is from the experiences that we were able to gain in our research in Kidamat. And each one of those layers has a different uh, different uh, characteristics. When will they come as an individual? Will they come as a family? Will they stay in a camp? Will they stay outside of the camp? And so these variety of numbers are all in here. And so this is an input table. Uh, one of the important numbers uh, is the multiplier. And so basically our research indicates uh, that um, this multiplier can be from one person in a camp, meaning the worker that we hear would be 5,000, so that person is in a camp. For each one of those one people in a camp, there is, uh, could be as many as one in a town to as few as one to three. And so in this, in this uh, permutation, we chose to, we chose to use uh, uh, for every three people in a camp, one in a town, which is what we would call a very conservative approach. The other part that we have included in here is LOA. That has a, uh, that's a living out allowance. Uh, if, if it is provided, that, that creates a, quite a bit of a difference than if it's not provided. So th these are the details that, uh, that are part and parcel of, of this model. Um, and um, so once we, once we plug those numbers in, once we plug those numbers in, then uh, we get, you know, graphs. And so in this, in this permutation that, um, that you have in front of you, you'll see that uh, the population of the 2016, I'm kind of hesitant on increasing it because I may do something, but I will try it. So in this permutation here, so this is year, so the project starts in 2017. That's when we elected to, to, to proceed. In 2020 is the peak, uh, the peak, uh, and there'll be 25,000 people in the greater Prince Rupert area. Uh, in, our, in our numbering, we have a regional population, so we include Port Edward. And um, when we look at the composition of, of the people who will be there, uh, the projections are that uh, there will be approximately 1,500 uh, people that we, that, who will be in a family groupings and there will be 2,500 people who will be single individuals. And so the part that, uh, that we took off here, uh, we're not exactly sure if we can do it, but we are working in trying to uh, project uh, the likeliness of this being apartments versus houses. So that's a, you know, uh, when, when, we, when we were testing this thing internally, you know, we had questions, you know, that this is mostly assumptions. And yes, it is, it is mostly assumptions. It's the best guess that we can take. And we are seeking actively more, better information from the companies, which we still haven't gotten. 
So that's a population indicator. Uh, housing indicator is the one that probably received the most, the most um, um, attention in 2015. It started with Salvation Army survey. Uh, this was a, what they call difference between a scientific and an honest survey. This survey here was done as part of the ministerial initiative and it was conducted by Captain Shield and it was done during the Christmas turkey giveaway and uh, there were 700 and some odd turkeys that were given and he received 690 responses. And so we have applauded and such. Uh, the questions are not necessarily helpful, but we do have some fairly good information in terms of the, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the poverty level in, in town. Uh, we have a Go Plan survey. Uh, th that was the survey, Go Plan Market Housing Survey, a non-market housing survey that was a larger initiative of, of, the, uh, of the Housing Committee, and that was also quite well uh, reported, and uh, we also have good results. They are posted on the website. Prince Rupert Non-Market Housing Inventory. Uh, again, uh, we have now a good inventory and a good base for 2000, for, m for May 2015 um, in terms of the um, uh, um, um, vacancy rates. Um, but, but more important, we have a good inventory. We know now all of the providers and all of the facilities uh, that, are, that, that are referred to as non-market housing inventory, non-market housing, which starts with Macola housing and includes a variety of the other ones, in, such as, for example, the senior citizen, citizens housing, the Cane Island Society. <coughs> uh, we also have affordable housing and uh, secondary suites, uh, uh, current uh, practices and policies inventory in British Columbia. We've also gotten some information on, um, on some of the locations in, in Alberta, and I think uh, we've looked at some, some of the examples in Washington. Uh, so that, that, that's the inventory. So basically what we try to do is to get, get what other people are doing and what are the tools that are available to us throughout legislation. And so it's, it's a fairly good uh, piece of document that, that will be referred to a little bit later on. Land base indicator. Land base indicator, um, again, it's a self-descriptive. It's about land base. And generally what we're doing here is looking at the city-owned lands for this exercise. Um, and um, one of the big pieces that we needed to do is get environmental suitability assessment, which is, you know, we live on the island that's, uh, that's, um, that's crisscrossed with, uh, with rivulets to creeks to even what some are called rivers. Um, so we have fish habitats and, you know, deer run around and we have wolves and birds and such. And all of those creatures need to be considered in a, in a right aspect. Um, and it's better to know about it earlier than later. Uh, to, to assure that, uh, that our developments are, are, are sensitive to the environment. Um, city on lands are divided in three groupings. There's infill lots. Those are the lots that are immediately adjacent to the water, sewer, and roads, meaning that you can actually you know, drive off the pavement and it's right there. Um, the uh, perimeter lots are the lots that are just behind um, the streets, you know, so it's a generally a small distance to build a road and you don't have to install main truck, ma trunk mains and, and water mains and sewer mains. Um, and green fields are the lands where you need major work, major uh, transportation access routes and uh, definitely um, the trunk mains and uh, water and sewer trunk mains. So uh, that, that work uh, got, off, got out of the running blocks very, very quickly. Um, in 2014, but uh, we kind of took a bit of a back seat. Uh, but infilot work has infilot work has um, um, progressed quite a bit. Uh, we, we've gone through a second level of analysis. Uh, we identified 200 and some odd uh, infilots in our in the city owns that are immediately available uh, through a process that included uh, council um, council. Um, um, tour, uh, we whittled it down now to less than 100. So there are 100 lots for sure that are not developable. And I think that by the time we're finished looking at the information that we have, we'll be looking at you know, a few dozen of lots that are reasonably developable. There is a reason that they remain vacant. Many of them are used for city installations, and many are really in a, in a tough spot to build. Um, 
So this work, uh, the, the, the work on, on, on the green field and perimeter lots got off to a really good start when we got into GIS and we were really, really active. Uh, but then we also found out that, that the, our data that we are working with is not necessarily of high quality, so we kind of lost a little bit of uh, energy on that one. But you know, in a in a first quarter of this year, we're going to be getting back to this piece of work. Um, one of the things that we really were sadly missing was this environmental suitability assessment, and also uh, the topography mapping. And and we have gotten since then a lidar. Uh, mapping, which is a, again a, po a trade name uh, that will give you uh, topography that's of a, of a really high quality and will help us a great deal on this work. So that's uh, <clears throat> that's on uh, on the work that we have done. And um, what next? Uh, sort of virtual shopping list. Uh, we need to complete the land base, uh, complete other population projection model. I'm quite excited about that one. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, energize innovative housing competition, affordable housing policy, but probably the most important pieces that are that are in front of uh, us now is to coordinate, to coordinate um, the work that planning for major projects has produced with uh, the long-term planning, things like uh, Hayes 2.2 vision and rebuild Prince Rupert, um, as well as the core planning, uh, things like um, the housing policies that are going to be driving both, they're going to be driving both the planning for major projects and the core planning stuff. Um, so the, the, you know, these three, the short-term planning, the planning for major projects, and medium type kind of planning, uh, uh, community plans and official community plans, and the uh, zoning bio development permit areas, when we do this medium medium level plans, generally we, we uh, the, the horizon is five to ten years, and 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 both of our zoning bylaw and official community plan are in their second part of the life cycle. They're eight, seven to eight nine years old, so that piece needs to be number one coordinated and updated, and uh, and then of course uh, the 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 long term plans even though it may not seem that way, but the data we're starting to correct um, with the, the strong recommendations as to how to continue measuring and creating trends will definitely help the long-term planning um, in a 20 to 25 year sort of life cycle. So the, the high potential of conflict, so what we want to coordinate, we want to reduce the conflicts. That, that's really what, where we are now. And, um, and um, you know, the conflicts, conflicts are becoming evident in my office, at least with the amount of work that's on the table, perhaps even when it comes to, you know, managing policies and, and, and regulations that we have with respect to applications that we receive. So this is a, this is a graph of, of our activities uh, since 2000 and since 2000 and uh, if I can do a little more, yeah, okay, yeah. Since 2009, uh, this bundle here is development permits, and you can see we started with one in 2009 because that's exactly when we adopted development permits. Uh, last year we had 18. Uh, development variance permit, uh, there was a bit of a up and down, but uh, 2014, seven, 2000 and. Uh, and uh, 15 was 13, so nearly doubling it up. And zoning applications, uh, we actually didn't have very much happening until 2010, uh, 2013 with one, and then we jumped very quickly to seven, noting that two applications were submitted in very late 2014, so we can actually bump the 9 to 11. So again, we are looking at doubling of zoning applications, and therefore they're in front of you almost on, at, the, at every council meeting. So uh, that kind of uh, that kind of concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So just before you leave, it sounds then that there's two components next. One is a public engagement piece around 
how we're going to look at the end of this potential boom. So I think that's being addressed then through the redesign Rupert process, the CDI process, which should be getting going here actually early 2016. So I think that process then we might handle that component. But what you're saying then, it sounds like there's this integration of policies now that need to occur. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'd like to do here uh, for Mr. Mandrick's record, I'd like to put a mo notice of motion in uh, to create a working group or a term for a terms of reference for a working group to integrate the planning for major projects, OCP, and affordable housing policy development that is required now to take these things to the next stage. And that would look at the midterm and short term things we need to do for policy, look at the OCP, look at zoning bylaws, those type of things. And that's something I could work on with the city manager and the planner in the next couple of weeks before our next meeting to get to council uh, to s create a plan. And what do you feel is a time frame that we could complete this integration uh, policy if we were to get a group together and really hone in? What's your estimate if you were to give one? Um, well, first of all, uh, Mr. Mayor, you know, whenever I do this, people look at me strange. Now you're doing this as well. Many graphs we've looked at. So, you know, to put together sort of the, the, the framework, the framework around how these two pieces will work together, it's a sort of a headpiece. It's almost like a headpiece of a of official community plan, where the goals and objectives of the official community plan of this planning process. Uh, you kind of get me st standing and thinking a little bit here. Um, at eight to ten weeks, uh, it would be sort of it would be kind of an aggressive schedule. That if everybody wants to be uh, aggressive, I'm for it. Eight to ten weeks. Okay. Well, it just sounds like. The faster we get this together, then the easier it is it for developers that come in, the easier it is for affordable housing, the easier it is for integrating two different plans into one bigger plan. Is that? Yeah, it's going to be easier for me in the end, Mr. Right. Mayor. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Mandrick, if you can record that for, uh, we'll get some terms of reference here for the next meeting uh, for council to review. Um, I think that's probably the next step. And that way, Redesign Rupert will approach the public part of this, which we need to get the public engaged with this conversation, um, which is a multi-modal effort through different stakeholders. And then the policy stuff is going to take a working group to really hone out what the uh, short-term, mid-term, long-term yeah. goals here are. Yeah. And, and just as a sort of a clarification, the, uh, the process that the uh, Northern Development Institute will be carrying will assimilate some of the requirements that, the, that this, this will work it in. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That, that'll work. Uh, yeah, so my inept words of coordination are exactly that, you know, this, this you know, to coordinate the short term and the long term is so important because they should be complementary and they can be complementary. And in the end, the base data we're collecting here will be helping both of the projects. And, and yeah, I, I think that's a very good idea. Great. Okay, any other questions from Council? <coughs> Councilor Cunningham. Senator, in your personal opinion as a planner, these figures you've got there and that what, how are they going to impact, and do we share the information with, say, the school board, uh, our golf course, our rec center, our PAC, our museum, and our library? They're going to have a large impact in those areas as well, aren't they? You mean our modeling? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. I, th I think, um, you know, the, the whole idea. Now, our model is not available on our website. And there's two reasons why I didn't bring the Excel spreadsheet to show here. One reason is that I would probably get lost and I'll be probably rotating it in the wrong way. And number two is uh, we don't want to have this information uh, misused before we are finished with it um, because if you pull wrong numbers you can have some drastic results and, and, and that would be misleading. Now that being said the whole idea is that we need to kind of share this thing in the entire community, and that's why my sort of looking at, my, at, the, at, at the city manager that this consultation period is going to be community as individuals, but also organizations, and, and that includes the organizations that you have mentioned, and it includes probably 
many others, like a college, for example, and Chamber of Commerce, and um, uh, Norton Health, you know, uh, so the numbers that we are, that we are producing here are, are, are numbers that are community-based. And so while we are kind of concentrating on the things that city, that this body here has the uh, responsibility and they can change, we're also kind of urging for everybody else to step in. And so, you know, we can do it two ways. We can do it by, um, by um, inviting or, or being forthright, or we can, be in, we can be inclusive and say, you know, sh share it, you know, it's yours. If it's on a website, it's yours, read it, good information. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Will it be available to these organizations? Yes. Will I be wanting to show it to them? Probably not. I just wanted to know, with the figures you've got, what impact we would have on on these institutions, like you know, the the library, the PAC, the recreation center, and things like that. If if we get this influx of people, what impact will it have on those facilities, and are they prepared for it? I guess the answer is, you know, we can offer the information and each organization is going to have to do their own analysis. You know, you know, can, can we do analysis for other organizations? I'm sure that we can take on the responsibility, but I think that by giving them the baselines and information that uh, they should, for example, the creation department, I talked to Vera on a number of occasions, you know, it's like, take a look at the numbers and see how they're going to affect you and, uh, you know, we'll help as much as you can, but, you know, at that point you have to kind of engage a, maybe a different set of expertise to say, how is that going to, how is that going to affect me? After we can tell you how, what the numbers are and how they're going to work. Hopefully that answers your question. Other questions from council? Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Krekic, I just have a quick question about uh, timelines because I, I don't, I don't think it's any secret that uh, a, a priority of council has been uh, an affordable housing policy. So I'm, I'm wondering, just off the top of your head, when we might expect to see um, a, a first draft or a recommendation. So with this little sort of um, side path that 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 actually is a good one, um, I would have been more aggressive if we didn't do this because. So the, the entire planning process here that's in front of you is what we call a comprehensive planning process, meaning that you need to kind of go step by step to finish to the end. F because of a variety of the reasons, we had to turn it to incremental model, which means step by step, and sometimes going back and forth. And at times, we also did an ad hoc model, which is the least, least desirable, flying by the seat of your pants. By luck, or by good work, I was able to retain the comprehensive intent. And so how quickly can we get to affordable housing? I think that's one of the pieces that, that you know, we can start working on pretty well quick. But rather than depending on staff to give you recommendations, I think a good start would be for council to, it's only 25 both of these reports are about 20 to 25 pages long. I, I'm assured that we don't write voluminous reports. And so it'll give you sort of the, the, the taste of what's going on. And then when we sit down to talk, probably best would be in a, in a workshop session is to, is to you know, find out what are, the, what are different opinions as to what we can use. Affordable housing, the first thing that we have to start is, you know, and we still haven't gotten grips on that, it is what is a market affordable housing in Prince Rupert? You know, I mean, have my professional opinions, you know, and, and, and other people can have their professional opinions, you know, but the reality of the facts are that uh, we, you know, affordable housing is a very, very uh, nebulous term, you know. How can we affect uh, affordable housing, you know, for example, by increasing um, the number of, of, of uh, secondary suites is the piece that now starts to dovetail into this conversation. So how quickly would, would, would say this lag of a maximum 10 weeks, 
I'm sure that whoever is in a working group or committee or whatever it's called, that those pieces will always be put forth as one of the most important ones. Technically, I want to finish the land base plan first. So I know how much land we have, but as I said before, you know, putting one thing in front of the other just means that we uh, work a little bit harder. So how quickly it can be done? It can be done by mid of this year. When the GO survey was first started, one of its priorities was affordable housing and housing period. And another 10 weeks will be well over a year since it was initiated. And putting it into simple terms, I still don't see any feet or boots on the ground as far as that we spent a lot of time on housing. We still don't have a lot of statistics we need. And I don't, I don't know, like, you know, one year seems to be a long time to be waiting for statistics. It should, you know, like we were hoping, like some of us feel that we don't even need the statistics. We know we have a problem and it has to be addressed. And by us delaying a, at least a year, there are people that are moving, can't, two families moving into one house. You know, people ca people cannot afford the, the prices of rent in that in the town right now. And, and this is getting to be a problem that is just going to multiply many times over if one of these projects go ahead. And, and we're still sitting here trying to figure out if we have a problem when we all know we do. Statistically, we have to know what that problem is, so. Oh, quickly, can I quickly, yeah, so I understand what Councillor Cunningham is saying. Uh, one of the reasons why it's taking so long is because affordable housing requires subsidization, right? And again, as Mr. Kreck said, you know, affordable housing isn't, it's a provincial matter, right? Fundamentally. However, we have a responsibility to, to support that process. So there is a group in town that is going after this together, all of us, which we're a part of as well. And that group, the ultimate question is that affordable housing without rig looking at what the services as well as required around affordable housing, right? There's different types of affordable housing. There's people that are hard to house, that have mental health issues or drug and alcohol addiction and things like that. There's so many different layers. By in my, I was going to do this update in the at the end of the housing update, but basically by March there's going to be a proposal put together to the province around what these this is going to look like. Our role is that what we've just been able to do is identify what the lots are for a place for affordable housing, which I don't even know if we really honed in on the actual lots that we've decided are for affordable housing yet. I'm not sure if we've done that yet, but you know we're. We're not done that yet, right? So our role in terms of getting the boots on the ground is only so far as much as somebody else comes in with money to actually help create that. We don't have the money to help put that together. However, we got land we can offer and we got good stats that we can offer too because you don't just build something without realizing who's moving in, when are they moving in, what types of demographics are moving in there. And so this is a community issue, right? It's not just council. And we're not spinning our wheels, we're doing everything we can as fast as we can to get this off the ground. But it's just something that's going to require some patience because it is such a hard, big topic to, to address. However, we're all concerned about it and we are working with, with the majority of the community groups that are involved with this to get this done. And I believe this year we're going to get it done. If we have the statistics to throw at the provincial government, they've got to react to them. We were bypassed this last few months for beds by Rich Coleman because we didn't need to have the need for it. And, you know, tell that to the people that are sleeping under a bridge or something that are freezing to death. You know, like, th these are things, if we've got statistics, that we, we spent a lot of money on this survey. And... Uh, I would like to see the statistics so then we can approach the provincial government and say, this is the problem, these are the people. And, you know, affordable housing, yeah, there's, there's lots of different categories. Some of them are subsidized housing. Some are, are, you know, I don't know the exact term, but it's for people that need help when they're living in a, in a place. And, and affordable housing to me right now is just a person that's working, 
some people at two and three minimum wage jobs and can't afford a house. You know, and that's BC Housing, that's McCola, I know it's their problem, but if we approach the provincial government with the statistics and say, this is how many people we have in this town fitting into that category, then they've got to react. And we need these statistics to do that. And one year, you know, I'd like to see it as fast as possible. The, the statistics, the statistics from the right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they've been published within a month after they were collected, you know, and, and, um, and um, um, I, I did speak to, uh, to um, I was at the event, I invited to speak on, on this topic, and I shared this thing with uh, the individual who comes here from time to time from, from BC Housing and said, here are our stats, take a look at them. It's very simple. So it, it's, you know, we have the stats, they're here. I'm not sure if you were thinking in terms of, you know, something different or the numbers themselves. I'm thinking something different, more along the numbers of the actual people and, yeah. and things like that, because it's, we're dealing with people here. Yeah. Yeah. And the other issue is that, as I said on another meeting, is, you know, I've been engaging the province many times about this topic, and we're competing with places like Surrey that are getting 50,000 people a year, I think it is, or I can't remember the number exactly, but, you know, versus us who have a couple, you know, maybe a hundred people who are in need versus those bigger problems when the province is looking at it, we're not on their priority list, right? And even a 5,000 person increase in this community compared to 50,000 people is really difficult to get that attention, get that money in. So we got to just keep being diligent. That's why the community is banding together around this. And it is frustrating, I understand, right? We need to help people, and that's what we're here to do. And we're taking a leadership role on that, and that's something I'm proud that we are doing. And I, I, I get the frustrations, but we are doing and working as fast as we can with the resources we have, with the, pow the power we got of the community. And I know that this year we're going to really lock in on this. And just give it a little bit more time and we'll, we'll do everything we can. We're working with Hackett Strait, we're working with Prax, we're working with North, North Coast Transition Society, with all the big players here that are, are involved with this, the Salvation Army, to, to, to get this going. So we'll just keep going and see if we can get a proposal on the table, something specific, find a piece of land that we're going to be able to hone in on and see if we can get this done, which is just one piece. So my thought is that if we get this policy group together, that will do the, what Council Morrow said, get the affordable housing things online, look at the OCP stuff, look at the planning for major projects integration. That takes eight to 10 weeks. We get all these policies lined up. Council can then pass these policies, which then will make the planning department easier. We'll get a bunch of affordable housing policies in place, which will give much more clarity to the community and help us facilitate this process even better. So, I mean, good work Thank you. is what you're doing. Um, and it's not easy to understand for the general public, and that's why this year, communications manager is going to be starting to digest this information and, and help help the community understand exactly what we're trying to do here. Other questions from council? Thank you very much for your time today. Okay, moving on to item 6A, a report from the Director of Operations regarding the memorial plaque for Colonel Peck. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Brain. <coughs> uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, the engineering department is in receipt of a request uh, with support from the Rotary Club to install a large boulder with uh, an inset for a memorial plaque for Colonel Peck. Uh, Colonel Peck was a Canadian recipient of the Victoria Cross, the highest award given for gallantry. Uh, upon his death in 1956, Colonel Peck's ashes were spread in Matlakatla Pass. The request is for the city to donate a rock uh, from our quarry at the landfill and have it placed in the Quinitza Rotary Waterfront Park facing Matlakatla Pass for the plaque to be set into. So the recommendation from the engineering department is uh, that Mayor and Council approve and support the installation of the memorial pack, pa plaque for Colonel Peck. Moved by Councillor Kinney, second by Councillor Ranhalla. Discussion? And just to clear uh, that this was the uh, tribute they did at the Remembrance Day ceremony? Was that the same? 
Correct, Your Worship. Great, yeah. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item 6B, uh, report from CFO regarding the 2016 Community Enhancement Grants. However, she's not here today. So, Mr. Long, would you like to quickly? Certainly, Your Worship. Um, we will see that, uh, that the CFO has presented a report. Um, I, I know that uh, the criteria um, that was used probably didn't um, didn't satisfy um, um, the, the uh, fuzziness of, of trying to come to a conclusion. It was mechanical. Um, uh, we represent uh, or we recognize that, and I think she's done the best she can. I think ultimately, though, council will have to make the choice as to where you want to put the money um, in into which uh, which organizations. Is there any thoughts, uh, Councillor Nish? Well, this is a, a tough one because uh, you know obviously we're looking at cutting on on what uh, people are requesting. Um, I've we've heard we've all sat here and uh, for I don't know how many hours one night uh, listening to everybody that spoke about community enhancement grants, the the major uh, groups being. Uh, the museum, you know, the, um, uh, what else was there, the Performing Arts Center, the library, we've, we've, we've talked to these people two, two years now and we've heard their concerns and their concerns are very similar to the city of Prince Rupert and that is we don't have the money. They're all in the same position, they're all lacking funds for general operations, uh, maintenance of buildings such as the city. Um, and, and obviously, if we had lots of money in our bank account, we would probably want to double what we give them. Um, but unfortunately, nothing has come forward yet in this community. We're hoping that 2016 is going to be the year uh, that uh, that brings us to another level and that we are able to really support these uh, en enhancement grants in the future. Um, I, I've been looking at the, uh, the numbers on here and... and these are hard decisions, and uh, we all have to to make them. Unfortunately, and there's always going to be somebody that's not happy. Um, I looked at the the numbers, and, and um, the the report that was put forward by our CFO um, basically was based on criteria which was set forward by Councilor Moreau. After we looked at this, uh, you know, everyone's got their own opinion, but. Uh, it's hard to, to, to look at these things and say, well, this guy's cut, this person's cut, this is cut, this is cut, this is cut. And uh, I, I wasn't comfortable with that. Um, so I'm putting forward a motion that, uh, that looking at the current, uh, what 2015 was dispersed, the money that was dispersed in 2015, uh, I would like to keep all of those the same other than to, to keep in the eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, because currently it's thirty six thousand over if we uh, if we uh, keep that in place. So what I suggest, and this is my recommendation, is that we take fifteen thousand dollars more for the museum and bring them up to one hundred and twenty six thousand. Uh, fifteen thousand more for the Performing Arts Center, bringing them to the one hundred and twenty five thousand. And we reduce the library by $66,000 and cap them at $500,000. They are currently taking two-thirds of the community enhancement grant money. And I just feel that uh, somebody has to... Uh, we we want to help everyone. And in order to help everyone, uh, unfortunately, the library who takes the majority of this funding, in my mind, is the one that needs to... To, to be affected. And the only reason why that is is because they are the one that can only be affected because they are the ones that can reduce hours a bit, they can reduce some services, and still be in business. Uh, we can't take any more money from the Performing Arts Center. We can't take any more money from the museum because these places will shut down if we continue to cut. So like I said, if we, if we do those recommendations, 15,000 more for the museum, 15,000 more for the, for, for the Performing Arts Center, and 66,000 less 
for the library, that will put us at $850,085, which is $85 more than the recommended $850,000. So that is my recommendation. So moved by Councillor Kinney, or uh, Nish, second by Councillor Kinney. Discussion? So I, I just have a, a question here on the numbers, Councillor Nish. You're saying uh, the, in, an increase of 15 for the museum, an increase in 15 for the Leicester Center, um, so that would, and that would be funded by a reduction to the library, and then the remaining 36 would also be reduced from the library in order for us to meet the $850,000 number that was recommended in order for us to not raise taxes. That, that's the wording of your motion? That's exactly the wording of your motion. Other than we would be $85 over um, because it, the number is $886,085 and with my proposal that would take us to $850,000 or and $85. So it's either we cut $85 somewhere else or we just go with the $85 over which I don't think we need to fight about nickels here. Um, so Basically, it's 2015 numbers with those increases and the subtraction from the library. And I'd just like to state that it's not a vendetta against the library. Uh, just unfortunately, the funding, in my eyes, is for the whole community. And I really think that people would be more... Uh, you know, things like Seafest. Uh, if we start saying, well, we've got to cut Seafest, we've got to cut, uh, you know, all these other people that have applied for grants we got to cut all these people in order to in order to um, you know just to keep the library functioning in my mind the library is just going to have to cut back like they did in the past when the funding wasn't there whether that means they got to close one day a week or uh, you know they, they're just going to have to do what they have to do providing this this more motion goes forward but that is my recommendation uh, I feel that it keeps every group here happy uh, except for the library it also um, provides a little bit of extra money for the Performing Arts Center, which I feel is a very important part of our community and is we don't want to see that fall apart. And I also think that the museum is, they've been struggling for years too and, and give them a little help too. Other comments? Councilor Renha? <coughs> we, uh, we have limited funds, we all know, but uh, and uh, other option is like to increase the tax and I don't think our residents are ready to increase the tax. But I think for library this one will be big cut because uh, for many people that's their second home, especially homeless people, they wait for library to open, use the internet, read books, use washroom. So I think that that's a little bit too big cut for them. And other, other option I was wondering like uh, if we can for one time we can help them from our legacy fund to give them keep everybody help, like uh, make them demands whatever they're asking just for one 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 time because uh, this one be big effect on library if we can do this way I tend to agree with uh, Councillor Rondala. Uh, you know, we took money out of the legacy fund for major projects. As uh, I sort of questioned Mr. Kraken earlier about the impact it's going to have on our institutions in this town. And I don't think this is the time to be cutting back on them. And if we found money for major planning, for projects out of the legacy fund and that. That legacy fund is owned by the people of this town. It is the residents' money as well as the council's money. And we've been using it to plan for major projects. And part of major projects is the recreation, the theater, the museum, the library, and a lot of the other cornerstones of this community that have been built up over years. Whether the library is getting too much or not, that's an argument that uh, I, I like Councillor Nish's proposition, but I just don't like seeing the library cut that much. I, I think that might be cutting it too close to the bone. Again, the library is not here to ask these questions of, and I don't see any reason why we can't use some of the funds from Legacy for one year to keep this going. 
I know people disagree with me and think it's a very slippery slope, but uh, we've used legacy funds for one year or three years for other projects, and it just seems to be the doors open for a certain part of it and closed for a certain part of it. And I really think that uh, Councillor Rendawa has a good point. Uh, I, I, I can't stress enough my position that y utilizing legacy for anything other than planning for major projects, the, the distinction is, is we're either preparing for growth, it's a temporary expenditures that we've earmarked to prepare for this, this economic growth that's coming, versus operational budget. And as soon as we start any one-time use, for operational budgets versus preparing for major projects, the, the, it, it's, just, it's, it's not a, a strong, it's, it, there's no policy that would ever, th there would be any exception to any rule. We, would, we could have any amount of people uh, coming to us with, with any type of project and just asking us to dividend that little bit extra for one-time use. And so the distinction I think that's extremely important to remember is the planning for major projects budget that we approved uh, when we were first elected, it's temporary in nature and it's earmarked for our institution to be prepared for rapid economic growth. It, it's, not, it's not operational in nature unless you want to categorize it as temporary operational. And so I don't think utilizing any legacy funds f for this purpose is a good idea. It opens us up to so many policy issues. So. Um, I mean that's my that's my particular stance on that. But uh, in terms of Councillor Nisha's suggestion, um, I, I think it's pretty clear the consensus here at the table is is we would rather uh, not raise taxes and make these tough decisions rather than give try to make every single person in every single organization happy at the expense of the taxpayer. I think we're, we've all got consensus around that point. Um, but I'd like to suggest a, a friendly amendment if it's, if it's possible for the mover and the seconder that uh, we don't want to be having these discussions every year and haggling over amounts that amount to one one thousandth of the city's budget. We don't want to be having these conversations every year. So my, my suggestion for a friendly amendment, if you guys are okay with it, would be to, to add that uh, as part of this motion that council also directs staff to develop um, a standardized multi-year funding agreement with these major grant recipients that would come into effect before the next round of the community enhancement grants, which I believe we start in September every year. So okay. if you guys are open to that, I'd like That'd to put right? that on the floor as a friendly amendment. Okay. Yeah. So okay with that. Council I'd rather I would feel more comfortable with that being a separate resolution rather than tying it in with this because it's something that has to be addressed and whether this the enhancement grants pass or not that is a resolution that should be put into action so that there's stability with these institutions as well as with the city so I'd rather see that as a separate resolution than part of the first resolution because we're still discussing the first resolution in its it, in its whole at the moment? He's just adding it. I mean, I don't think it matters if it's a not separate resolution or not. I think he's just saying we need to enter into five-year long-term contracts with yeah. these groups either way. And passing this or not passing this, that needs to happen. So I'm not sure if it needs to be out of a separate motion. But one thing I will say here is, you know, to echo what Councillor Moreau said is, yes, we have passed a temporary budget planning for major projects budget that has their own line, I line items that's all about increasing capacity for us to be able to handle what's happening to this community around major projects. It's been specific. It also came from money that we gained from an LNG company as well. That way it's kind of relevant. We want to make sure that legacy stays for infrastructure, things like that. It's not that I wouldn't say, it's not that I don't want to do this. As Councillor Anish said, we would love to give them everybody what they want all the time. And as Councilor Nish said too, is that we're on the cusp of potentially making new money this year. So this isn't a permanent thing if we go ahead with this. However, we do have a, a grant writer at the city and the library and other groups here have access to that grant writer 
and there's other grants out there that these groups really need to take their own initiative and really start looking for those, fun those funds. This is a one year thing, we're going to piece this together one year, but we're also, if we enter into these contracts, then we'll be able to negotiate something that gives permanency and some, and some really um, security for these, the big organizations anyway, so that they don't have to keep coming back to us every year, that they know what they're going to get every year and that they're comfortable moving forward, and that's something we need to gauge, so I agree with that put forward, but in terms of trying to take a one-time thing in, well then what happens next year if we're in the same boat, then we do that and we keep doing that. Eventually we just keep dipping money in at the whim of council type of thing, and I think we just need to be careful with that. So at the moment, I see the motion as uh, it's presented, and we'll still can have discussion. So, Councillor Renhala and then Councillor Cunningham. Yeah, you understand that like it's one year, right? And the next year, if we get other projects going, we can help them more. So, like your amendment is like 850 for five years. What's your amendment? Like you want amendment. Uh, my amendment would, it, it wouldn't set any numbers, but it would direct staff to enter into uh, long term, like a, um, I think we're kind of around consensus of around five years would be a good multi year funding agreement. So it would be negotiation about what they would get every year, but I think working from the baseline of what they currently get. Yeah, like uh, we are we just talking about one year. I understand that, like, we are offering doing infrastructure and helping other, uh, hiring some people here to get ready for uh, the projects. But on the other hand, as a counselor, as a, we, our job is to look after the homeless people. We are b already talking about homeless, right, people. So uh, lots of people using their facility, right? So if we c keep on cutting that hours or jobs there, right? So where those guys will go in winter and other places? So that's why I say just see, give them one, one year break and tell them, okay, if in the next year nothing happen, we have to cut you or you have to or look after yourself, right? But uh, that's all just, just for one year, I'm asking. Councillor Cunningham, then Councillor Nish. You just mentioned that this money came from an LNG company. It's a legacy fund for the city. And at the same time, you said it's uh, it's for of the infrastructure of the city. Well, I consider these institutions part of the infrastructure of the city. You know, they're not as important as turning on your tap and the water coming out or flushing your toilet and it goes someplace, but they are important to this city and they're important to the residents. One thing residents don't want is their taxes increased. Secondly, they don't want their services cut. You know, it's a balancing act that sometimes we get caught with in that. But, you know, we've had no trouble dipping into legacy for other things, and I don't see a problem with it for one year. We keep hearing how, you know, there's a golden rainbow out there, and in the next year it's going to be a good year, and we're going to come into this and that. We might, we might not. But it gives these institutions one year to prepare themselves. I don't think we're setting a precedent here, because we can sit in this room and say no to whatever we want. It's not, we can say A or nay, and it it's, doesn't matter. You know, next year, if a bunch of people come here and said, well, you did it last year, well, that was different last year because we thought we were going to have some money. We didn't get it, so guess what? We're not, no one's getting anything this year because we don't have the money. That'll be next year's problem. This is the problem today. And, you know, this is a pretty good compromise, but it still hurts one person, and it still doesn't solve the problem. But... You know, I, I just think that uh, dipping into legacy for a little bit of money like this, it hasn't been a problem dipping into legacy to hire people and do other things, even though it might be contingent on a project that might never happen. But still, you know, I know the PAC, I know the museum, th they're struggling, they've hardly got any staff, you know, they're big buildings, and that, yes, we've got a grant writer, but that grant writer is going to be going after the same grant for different people, and it's going to be very difficult. We've got to pull this together, and we've also got to get these groups together to be using that grant writer. Councillor Nish, then Councillor uh, Kinney. When I ran for council, one of the major things that I had uh, said was that I would love to see it one year when I could look at my tax bill and say, look, my taxes didn't go up. Um, 
we chose to go with a, a number of eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars for community enhancement grants. Uh, we were asked for um, uh, with the, with the new people who aren't even included on the list. I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of one point two or three million dollars. Um, uh, uh, one statement that I had made uh, was that we need to live within our means. Um, I think that's an important part of 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 being on council is is trying to balance and juggle so that as a community we can live within our means and and this isn't about me picking on 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 the library it's just unfortunately the library is the only one that really we can pick on um, everyone else is is already at a shoestring um, you know the museum barely has anybody working there the 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 performing arts center has two employees I mean they can't cut anymore and 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 the rest of the groups on here are are um, they're already cut um, so it's just a matter of someone who's receiving most of our funding um, they are the ones that are having to take the hit um, that is the only reason why I, I have said the library um, but I really do think that they need to be the one that takes advantage of the grant writer the most and 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 use that money I know they when they were presented to us they talked to things about things like such as upgrading their computer system and and other programs that they wanted to do well this is their opportunity to instead of uh, you know an operational budget as this money is uh, I'm putting forward to pay for these things let's try and use that ground writer to our advantage and get these things into that library whether it be new computers um, and then unfortunately maybe they do have to make some small cuts no I, I'm not saying they need to close down I'm saying they need to maybe cut maybe it's a uh, two hours a day I mean maybe it's an hour a day it's 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 Sixty-six thousand dollars is what it is, and, and it's sixty-six thousand dollars that I do not want to increase the operational budget, which is going to increase our property taxes. I do not want to increase property taxes this year. Councillor Kay, thank you, Mayor Brain. Um, I also feel that the library is very important, but I also want the public to know that the library not only do we give money from the city but they also receive it from the regional district, whereas the performing arts and the museum do not. They're getting money from other places too. They're not going without. So. Okay, Councillor Morrow, then Councillor, or Councillor Ranhauer, then Councillor Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We are not asking for cutting anybody like performing arts center or museum. We just asking to give help, like extra money from legacy fund to help everybody else. We're not asking to cut this or anybody else. Yeah, and yeah. Realizing money from legacy doesn't solve the problem either. It, it leverages our financial future and it brings, the, it brings this conversation back to the forefront again next year. It, it doesn't solve the underlying problem, which, which is there's not enough money to go around. So our efforts, and we've been really focused on it this year, I'm quite proud about how much we've focused on trying to generate new revenues from the city with new development. That's, that is the way to increase everyone's share of the pie, is to increase the size of the pie. Legacy does not help solve that problem. Um, now I just want to make two points. Um, one in support of Councillor Nisha's motion, and one with a, a bit of a concern is uh, the, the thing, the, the fundamental difference between the library, uh, the Leicester Centre, and the museum is uh, the, the library has the flexibility. We can talk about um, their flexibility with hours of operation, whereas the Leicester Centre and uh, the museum are already on a budget that any reduction in funding might not just mean a re reduction in hours of service, but just might mean elimination of service. And we've heard that loud and clear. Whereas the library, uh, they, they do have additional flexibility that the other institutions do not. The concern that I have though in, in reallocating funds is, I, 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 I said this at the, at the last meeting last month, is I don't want us to be a council that picks through line items and tries to 
try again tries to focus on 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 I can't I can't think of another word other than to say micromanaging and I so I, I I'm not comfortable with us setting the specific number of the reductions and increases because we haven't heard what exactly the impi impact might look like we don't want to be the ones dictating uh, you know you must close this day at this time like we, we want to offer these organizations the, the ability to make those decisions ourselves so I'm not quite sure how we can address that that concern uh, in this forum well I think as you mentioned the five-year or the long-term contract will be able to address those concerns and as Councillor Kinney said too, the library does have other access to other money, right? There's other grants out there that they do receive. And there is a regional district that does provide grant money as well. And so as you, again, it's the one that has the flexibility that's not gonna be crippled by a cut. Whereas the museum will, right? We know that that organization needs a dire attention, right? I mean, no, we don't even, I know the council doesn't even really want to be making this decision, but however, we know we need to give the taxpayers a break. Mm -hmm. and, and that this may be a one-year thing or maybe more, but the long-term contract situation will, in the end, resolve the long-term security for these, these, these community groups, the, the big ones anyways, that need that certainty. So at this moment, I'm in favor of the motion with the amendment. Um, Councillor Cunningham. I think it's rather ironic we keep talking about taxes here. We don't even know yet what our tax base is going to be. You know, we have passed a few projects in this town that are going to be bringing in more tax money. That's what this council ran on, and that's what we've accomplished in the first year. We've rezoned a lot of property that's going to bring in extra taxes. Some projects have already started. And that, and so we're discussing something here that the probability might be, be nothing when tax time comes along. You know, like, I, I don't know why we do the enhancement grants when we don't even know when, what our taxes are going to be. You know, like, I know they need their money at the beginning of the year to continue, and I know some of them, you know, I see no problem in floating them 50% of whatever they want, and then waiting and finding out when taxes or when the budget's actually done, what we can deal with. You know, like, their, their, their budgets run from January to December. Right now, most of these institutions are running on a, an empty tank because they don't have any money to pay their bills and that until we pass this enhancement grant. You know, like, if we float them an X number of dollars at the beginning of the year to get them over the hump until we know what the budget's going to be and then we can deal with it, that might be another way of doing it, too. The one thing that we heard in the feedback from all the groups was how we did the 65% last year was that that doesn't work for them. They need, the majority of their spending comes right at the beginning of the year, and that's why they need that certainty, which is why we're doing it this way. However, Ms. Bauman would like to start the budget process with us in September every year to get ahead of this so that we don't have to be doing this. So to re-shift how we do the budget and re-shift how we allocate funds to these community groups. So again, it might be that next year, that 500,000 gets increased to the level they need because somehow with the condo coming online and the India Avenue church uh, retrofit coming online and new tax revenue coming in, we may be able to afford it. So the, the good news is that we're, this isn't a permanent situation. However, for this year, with what our goals are, which is to reduce taxes or to freeze taxes and to, to be financially prudent, I feel that what Councillor Nisha has said here is, is the middle road and, and, and it gives what we need done. You know, we're talking about taxes here. Each proposal in no way raises taxes. What Councillor Nuss has re recommended doesn't raise taxes. What Councillor Gravinder and I have recommended doesn't raise taxes. I don't, why, don't know why we keep dangling that taxes. Our taxes are not going to go up this year, as far as I'm concerned. We've got more revenue coming in than, than we did the previous year. Hopefully, we can draw the line. You know, I, I don't see that being a problem. You know, if we're going to we're gonna go with this, we'll go with it. But, you know, we could hear, sit here all night and discuss this, and I think we're at a stalemate, and let's just call the question and get it over with. Question. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Motion's carried. 
OK, moving on to item 8A. Uh, we have correspondence for action. Um, there's a recommendation that council directs staff to provide a letter of support to the Prince Trooper Crime Stoppers Youth Anti-Gang Initiatives and Crime Prevention Grant Application for the Bob Quast Memorial 1946 Mercury Police Car Restoration Project. Uh, it's a really great project. Um, this project uh, in grant actually has already been um, put in. However, we needed a council resolution. So I wrote a letter to the grant teen agency to, to, to let them know that I didn't see this being a problem for the council to have a, a letter of support. However, it was right at the end of December and we weren't going to meet. So I, I sent that, you know, we're going to bring this to the council's table to see if we can get a letter of support uh, just to let them know that this was coming, the granting agency, because the grant deadline has already passed. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so that's, so anyway, so the recommendation is there. So moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Kinney. Discussion? Question. Okay, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Bylaws 10A, a report from the City Planner regarding proposed zoning amendments bylaw number 3384-2015 to permit the use of shipping containers in the P1 public facility zone and M1 light industrial zone. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so, as... Um, Quickly, the reason for this report is that the current zoning bylaw restricts uh, containers to M2 and M3, that's uh, uh, two heavier industrial zones. Uh, generally, the area that, that that is allowed for is the M2 zone is in uh, intersection of Prince Rupert Boulevard, the highway, and Shawatland Road, and then a little bit further down the road commences uh, heavy industrial area, or we call it waterfront industrial area, and we also have waterfront industrial area at the at the at the uh, head of the bay here. However, all of those properties are owned by the port and therefore out of our jurisdiction. Um, the original application was uh, submitted by School District 52, uh, but staff. Uh, uh, bundled some other locations into the proposed amendment that would also include uh, shipping containers in other P1 locations as well as an M1 light industrial zone which is our Yellowhead Industrial Park. <clears throat> as background, uh, shipping containers are cost-effective storage. They are generally watertight uh, they are uh, secure, they can be locked up. Um, they're good for anything from storage of materials to toys. Uh, on the flip side, uh, containers can become nuisance very easy you know, from, from the paint, uh, branding, uh, staining by um, rust, um, and so on one end, functionality can become an aesthetic uh, dilemma. Currently, Charles Hayes Secondary School possesses a shipping container that they are proposing to use for storage of sports equipment. The, the um, areas that the staff has had on side of the desk for, for a while now includes a public works yard, which has expressed interest in using containers for storage uh, that they have to do. Um, pack, uh, we actually did a little bit of a um, you know, soft uh, approach and allowed them temporary use for, for certain activities, but, but uh, you know, we always thought we should legitimize it, and there was some conversation about the recreation center also needing storage space for their sports equipment. So that's the uh, that's the sort of the background that brought us here. And staff has conducted some analysis on the other locations uh, in British Columbia, which um, is becoming almost pretty well 
Every major municipality has a bylaw dealing with containers. We selected North Cowichan, District of Chetwin, District of Kitimat, and City on Quinnell. I provided links to all of the research material. I didn't want to burden you with the reports, but they're fairly easy to access. The type of use is perm permitted in different zones. Uh, you know, they range and generally are included in industrial zone and the public zones. Um, there's one example. There's a picture in your in your in your in your um, in a report in your binder um, where it's used uh, uh, for for it's in a public public space in a P1 and it's used for the uh, um, uh, earthquake mater earthquakes emergency materials. Um, other things that, uh, that different municipalities are regulating include stacking, ventilation, and, and structural integrity. Uh, you can see that there is a variety of the, generally the rules arise from the, re, from, from the conflicts. Um, also, uh, number of containers, fencing, screening, and advertising, and I provided some numbers that different communities are using. And, and you know the recent the recent uh, sort of addition to the uh, to the configuration that sh that containers can be used is is essentially creating into buildings by and we have one going on on uh, on Shawatlands Road you know, where two containers are stacked up on either side with uh, with a roof structure on the top and then it can be either cladded or left open and in such situations they become a uh, building, and at that situation, they are subject to BC building code. Before, uh, if they're such simple containers, then they are not subject to the building code, and in fact, they bypass our development permit requirements, which we have known for a while, uh, but we have been fairly, you know, I imagine I was kind of waiting for a situation like this to see, you know, how we're going to proceed with it. The cost for this uh, for this uh, exercise, as I said, I, I didn't say it in the report. I waived the fees as I'm using it for for other purposes as well. Uh, the cost of the city for this amendment will be in the neighborhood of four hundred dollars for the uh, advertising in the newspapers. I've determined that we do not require on-site signage or direct mailing. In conclusion. Um, the uh, proposed bylaw, which you have on page 40, and I'll just flash it on the screen. Um, that's a wrong, that's a wrong. So apparently I, I placed a wrong uh, file on, on the screen, and I will not have uh, technical support. So we can just turn to page 40, and I'll read it from page 40. Um, it contains four major points. Um, so, if we are looking at page forty, number one, uh, section three point twelve, which is our general requirements at the front end of the zoning bylaw, uh, would include M one and P one in addition to M two and M three. Then in uh, section 71.4, which is special provision specifically relating to M1 light industrial use, um, we will include a special provision to say that shipping containers are permitted for the purpose of storage only. And in section 7.2.4, which is special provision for M2 zone, we will include a special provision that will say that shipping containers are permitted for purposes of storage in, and in support of main business operations. So that the example of main business operations in M2 would be um, uh, quick load, where the containers are part of the business right. rather than storage. A good example in M1 for storage would be Cal Tire, which is using it for storage. Um, and the last one is that the in public facility zone, P1, we would create a new, new section, which would be special provisions. And the special provisions 
we will say that shipping containers are permitted for the purpose of storage and must be uniformly painted the same <coughs> as the principal building. You'll see that I did not provide any special provisions in M3, heavy industrial zone. I, I felt that um, it would be redundant because in M3 zone, we are allowing containers and it's kind of, if we start specifying, then we need to be kind of mindful as to what we specify. And I felt uh, my approach to this bylaw is not to overdo it, to bring it to some reasonable, reasonable level. Now, keeping that in mind, and my comment about development permits, uh, with this bylaw passing, subject to it passing, uh, staff will take, um, um, I had a dilemma to include more regulations in our zoning bylaw, or to simply act on what we have, and we can do that by you know, just effectively by, um, by the staff, such as building inspectors and clerks, being uh, extra diligent to make sure that everybody now understands that if you're bringing, bringing a container on site, it will require a minor development permit, even though it may not require a building permit, and the cost for minor development permit is $60. And um, by the way, I didn't include those on our charts, because they basically double up on everything. Uh, and they take uh, the maximum one week for approval, and they can be done uh, by myself. That includes my report. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question, then, though. Um, so I noticed in the report here, so talking about North Cowichan, for example, mm -hmm. they say uh, they allow two shipping containers per lot in light industrial zones, 10 are allowed in heavy industrial, and one uh, is allowed in public use or institutional zones. Are we going to go down that road in terms of limiting how many Per zone, or what's your thoughts on that? But that was a dilemma. I'm looking at that, you know, things like ventilation, for example, a number of units per zone, or stacking. I, I, I you know, I had a lengthy conversation with the building inspector. M my opinion was to stay away from regulating the numbers, uh, because then, number one is enforcement, and number two is, you know, in in places like public public use. I think there is a fair amount of, of, of sincerity between public buildings to, to assure that we have nice buildings. And when we get into the industrial area, it's really difficult to, to kind of look at those numbers. We can try it, you know. Uh, it's a, you know, I was looking for a balance, you know, the essential versus uh, do we want to go further. But in a conversation, should that be something that be that you would like to consider? I can definitely provide that analysis for the next meeting. Councilor Nish, um, that was one of my uh, questions. Was was uh, you know, do you want uh, a business having twenty containers outside their you know light industrial building? Uh, now you're getting into the thing where everyone will just bring containers in and run their business essentially out of a container and which doesn't improve buildings it doesn't improve the, uh, and build our community and collect more taxes and you know if everyone can just run a business out of a container essentially and have a little office beside it well that's not going to do much for improving tax base uh, things like that so I do think we need to have some sort of limit on that um, and the other thing that concerns me is what are the uh, mechanisms as far as if someone didn't paint and follow the the bylaw what is their penalty because for an example that you're saying light industrial well we you know this this was um rezoned against you know my wishes uh, but the um uh, masonic temple so now all of a sudden people living on 6th East or 7th East are looking out their windows at a big sea can uh, parked beside the Masonic Temple and there's 10 of them there and they say Costco and all these shipping lines on them uh, in a residential neighborhood which has now been rezoned as a light industrial area. Um, that is my concern. Like, what is, what is our, uh, if someone didn't paint that container, what can we do about it and, you know, how long does it take to do that? And, and you know, is there a fine or, or you know, what's the deal? 
Yeah, Every offense uh, on a bar is punishable by two thousand uh, dollar daily f daily uh, 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 ticket. We have never implemented that. I don't know how many communities have actually gone down the road of implementing it. Generally, how we approach situations of that nature is, uh, you know, by a number of approaches to the uh, to the owner, and that and usually end up in front of the council uh, to try to resolve it before something does happen, such as, for example, going to to the courts and and seeking the remedy of of the requirements of the zoning bylaw. So it's 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 a tricky one. Uh, with respect to painting, with respect to painting, actually, you you bring a you bring a good point. Uh, uh, painting is only required in a public zones, not in industrial zones. So, you know, uh, we can we can definitely include painting in industrial zones. Uh, for example, M1, which is in a light industrial zone, um, um, and I was contemplating, um, you know, including such in uh, in a light industrial zone. But if you move to the uh, heavy industrial zones, you know, I I didn't think it was that necessary. But the point well made. Um, you had another point uh, earlier. What was your first point? Uh, on, on, I forget now. The, uh, how many are going to be on, like having them use on uh, like 20 containers oh, yeah. per? Uh, you, using using them for uh, for for commerce, uh, uh, containers are considered accessory buildings. They're not main buildings. They're they they have to be um, under under um, eleven point eight feet. Uh, so so you know. Uh, and 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 uh, they're not considered to be the main building now. If somebody has a small building and has three containers for storage and running the business like that, I imagine that's the sort of the entrepreneurship on one hand, or on the other hand, it could be considered to be clutter, and and we can put more rules around it. Um, do a quick follow-up, yeah. and then Councilor yeah. Kenyon. Um, like I said, I mean, you know, it's not that I feel that uh, we need to, you know, like the Yellowhead Center there. I mean, I wouldn't really expect everyone up there to to have to paint, you know, a light industrial have to paint their containers. But this is where I, you know, the only one that concerns me is, for example, where it's been spot zoned, and now it's in a residential neighborhood at light industrial. Now maybe there's something that we can do where if it's uh, within a certain area of a, of a residence, that maybe it has to be painted, because, you know, that to me is a big thing. I mean, I would, you know, if I lived on 6th East, I already wouldn't be happy that it's been rezoned light industrial. And now if all of a sudden I look at my window and I see a big, uh, you know, sea container out there, or there's 10 of them there, I mean, I would not be happy at all. Um, so, you know, I, but I don't, on the other hand, I don't expect Cal Tire maybe to paint, you know, their sea cans because they are in an, in an industrial area. And that to me is, you know, you don't want to... Uh, you know, stop business either. I mean, you know, you have to support the businesses, but there's a fine line there. And if we start uh, rezoning different uh, properties around town, um, you know, light industrial spot zoning them, maybe it's something we can say if it's spot zoned, it doesn't apply. Or, you know, I don't know, but I, I think we need to do a little bit more work on this one. Councillor Cunningham uh, and Councillor Renaud. Yeah, just to respond to, oh, to this thing, uh, definitely good point about Six East. Uh, uh, I, I will, I will, for the next meeting, uh, provide an answer for that, either through the through the bylaw or some other method. method. Uh, it was a good point. That I didn't think about that one. Okay. Councillor Cunningham and then Councillor Renaud. Well, I, I love Wade's idea there. I think it's a good idea, especially for something spot zone like that, and then you know also Park Avenue is uh, light industrial and the first last thing we want to see is people people coming off the ferry with a whole line of sea cans up park avenue you know that's another thing there like uh i i think we've got to come up with some sort of amendment to the bylaw where square footage of the building versus the number of square feet of cans you can have or uh square footage of the lot something like that you know like i i this this whole idea of, of these cans, I'd love to have one in my backyard. It's a great, quick garden shed, a little eight by eight, but, you know, I'd be the first one ratted on if I put it there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the thing being is that, uh, you know, we've got to address not just this, but commercial 
and as well as residential, they're starting to jump up everywhere. And uh, you know, if the only way we can control them is with a bylaw. I'm all for it. But can we refuse a development permit in uh, light industrial? Because they're going to have to come and get a permit to put the container on their property. Can we refuse it like any other development permit? So you brought a number of number of points in here. So P, on P1, the distinction between uh, M1, uh, M1 and M2 and M3 that is that in M1 it's only for storage. So you can only store, and and so the conundrum as to you know if a business is operating mostly out of out of uh, out of uh, containers, but it has a main small main building, is the example that you brought. You know, so let's say, for example, if you look at Cal Tire, um, a great num amount of their business storage is dependent on on that, and and we can see the numbers that are there. Um, so that would kind of take care of of the P one of, of of the potential of rezoning the area down a Park Avenue, and 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 the council has an option of of allowing anything from P from M one to M three. You know, or nothing at all. That 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 continues to be our option, but I would say that, you know, again, the conundrum here is that I'm 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 looking for your input because you know my attempt was to bring it to a intent level. You know, most of the examples that are here are regulatory level, and and so the regulations stack up. So I will I will. Look how to manage these these pieces, and uh, we'll see. We can definitely go higher, and nobody's asking me to go lower. You know, we can all, always raise the bar. So I will um, I will look at that, uh, uh, Councillor Cunningham. There was, and your second point was. Um, I think I answered your point. Okay, Councillor Ranhawa, then Councillor Nish. The second oh. one was just square footage. To square footage, yeah, yeah, to incorporate into the prior one, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with Councillor Nish and Councillor Cunningham, their points. Yeah, like if we love P1 and M1 using containers, we especially we are already struggling with parking lots, like parking space. If we allow that, I think that will make situation worse for the parking. Yeah. Any additional comments from Council? Councillor Nish? Uh, like I said, I mean, I, I'm not against the idea. I just I think there's a couple little loopholes that we need to take care of. Uh, you know, like I say, the painting is a big thing. Uh, you know, is it, when it comes to something that's involved in a neighborhood, um, and uh, and the not the, uh, the 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 amount. And I think that maybe that's something like Council Cunningham said, as far as square footage, like maybe if you have a certain size uh, lot, then it, you know you're allowed to have so many containers, and maybe we can come up with a formula for that. Because I, you know, I don't, I don't want to discourage businesses, and and I understand that some businesses, you know, can't afford to maybe build a new building, but you also don't want businesses really not contributing to the uh, to the economy, you know, the tax base by just plunking a bunch of containers somewhere and, and calling calling into business. So I really do think we need to work on the numbers and the and the paint maybe and the paint thing I think we could maybe do that with the spot zoning one because I think that's you know the would be the only issue I can see. I mean I'm not gonna complain if there's a sea can in the Yellowhead Center, but if there's a sea can with no paint on it sitting in Sixth Avenue, that's an issue in my eyes. Yeah, so um, it sounds like there's... Oh, good. So just to kind of re recapture the conversation here, the two issues that, that, that were brought up was the numbers per area. So I will, I will look at that now. That would be an amendment to the bylaw itself. And in terms of the painting, so if I'm, if I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, you're fine if if these units are not painted in M1, M2, and M3, if they are in the areas that we know now where they are. But if there's a spot zoning, or for example, uh, the area that's down on Park Avenue, how, how would that kind of work out? And I'm just gonna have to, you know, put my thinking cap and try to find out, do we have to do that in a bylaw, anything? And the questions I wanna know, if you are okay the way that I left M3 zone, which is basically mean you can do anything you want. 
maybe you can look at it as uh, w if it's within a distance of a residence uh, as far as painting is required and I think that would probably solve it because if you put within a distance you know if it's you know 200 feet from a house well then it's got to be painted uh, and and if not then you know something along those lines I mean obviously you can look at the numbers and that but that's just an idea actually along those lines too uh, look at a distance if per se on 6th Avenue there if it's within 50 feet of a residence the bylaw wouldn't permit a secan you know something like that you know like so if we do spot zone something like we did there it's restrictive to what can go on there or can't go on there because the last thing I'd want to see is a sea can sitting anywhere around there you know like yeah I, I think if it's within 50 feet of a resident you know that obviously you know once in a blue moon you get a residence within a light industrial but generally speaking you might have light industrial in a res in a residential area but not vice versa and so I, I think something along those lines would help too okay so obviously we have more questions answered. do we need a motion to direct that or just to come back to the next maybe okay uh, just simply pass the first reading and uh, and i will bring the, bring, bring, the uh, bring the report from the second reading and public hearing Next sure. Okay, so the recommendation is that Council gives first reading to the Parole City of Prince Rupert Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 3384-2015. Moved by Councilor Kinney, second by Councilor Niche. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Okay, report from uh, Director of Operations regarding road closure and removal of highway delegation bylaw number 3380-2015. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Macro Properties has uh, made a request to purchase three properties which are in the unused road allowance. Um, these properties are located adjacent to lands owned by the proponent called Digby Towers and Sherbert Gardens. The reason for the purchase is to allow the proponent to develop their site and fulfill their parking requirements. Uh, there are no costs associated with recommendations. However, the city would receive revenue from the sale. So the recommendation from uh, the engineering department is to adopt the proposed bylaw as stated. Just a quick you. question. Sure. Is this to prelude to them potentially uh, renovating or fixing up Digby Towers? Correct, yes. Okay. Other questions from council? Council Niche? Oh, okay. Uh, so you're moving the motion? Okay, moved by Councillor Niche. Second by Councillor Moreau. Uh, any further discussion? Question. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to reports. Uh, the Housing Committee. Uh, so just three things quickly. First is the Housing uh, Group, uh, uh, Innovation Group, that's going to be coming up with the Housing Services. <laughs> Uh, is going to have a draft report ready by March. Uh, Shauna Walters is the consultant that has been hired uh, to to help lead the group, which is a multi-stakeholder group in, com in the community. Number two, council uh, will need to work in a workshop environment with the planner once they're ready with the, with the uh, land-based things uh, to hone in on a site location that would be appropriate for affordable housing. And then once we zone in on that, to work with the housing group to figure out what the proposal would be for an affordable housing development. And number three uh, would be, uh, as I put a notice motion in earlier, to form a policy development group when, within eight to ten weeks to try to come up with the affordable housing policies that will be required for us to move the community forward that way. So I see three things happening with that. And I believe the groups, uh, the other housing policy group will be meeting at the end of January this year. Uh, so that's what I have to report out for the housing stuff. So it's we're really starting to make some traction now with this with this piece. Uh, so are there uh, reports or questions from council, Councillor Nish? Um, so I'd like uh, city staff to look into this. Um, so over the Christmas break, I was approached um, by the gymnastics club, and this was I was being approached as a, a, as a contractor, not as a counselor. So they had asked me to come look at a building, and so I went to this building with them, and you know we started looking at it, and I was trying to find out what their what their purpose was, and uh, you know they were looking for uh, a location. Now in a 
perfect world, I'd just say, let's just say a gymnastic club in Vancouver. Well, they're probably running seven days a week. They probably got thousands of people in their club and they can afford to operate out of a, um, you know, a, a building that's on its own and they can afford to pay the rent and they can afford to, to pay staff and do what they have to do because they have the population to do this. Well, our gymnastic club has been looking for a place to go um, because they would like to be set up all the time they don't want to have to take down but realistically this is a small town and they they don't have the 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 money coming in in order to afford the places and the places that the place that we were looking at that I that they had asked me to look at they were looking at repairs and stuff and the building is well, well beyond its uh, use and, and really is, you know, it should be almost torn down. Um, you know, and this is the, uh, this is what they're doing. They're looking for other options. And so, so I kind of flipped my hat around and I turned into a counselor that day and I said, why are you looking for another place? Are you not, what's wrong with the Civic Center? You know, what's going on? Um, so, you know, they're fine with the space at the Civic Center, but, you know, obviously in a perfect world, like I said, they would be set up where they could stay set up and they don't have to disassemble. But this is Prince Rupert. They don't have the population base. They need to disassemble um, if they can't find a place to go. And, I, and so I started asking questions. I'm like, well, why are you looking for a new place? Well, what it's come down to is they've been denied storage as of next May. Um, and I'm looking at this thinking, why is the storage not, why are you, like right now they currently rent about 180 square feet out of a 250 square foot room. Um, and basically it was put to them that the storage was going to be needed for something else. And, and I'm saying, in my mind, I'm looking at this thing, why are we trying to basically move the gymnastics club out of there because we can't provide them storage. It's a gymnasium. We need to we need to do what we need to do, and I want city staff to look into this and 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 you know here we are talking about sea cans and public spaces for for you know we need to offer these people that you know they would like the 250 square foot room. So how about we uh, use the old racquetball court in the civic center, or how about we use something else to take the stuff that we've got in there and move it to another room and give these people the 250 feet of storage that they are currently paying for. Uh, they're paying for the storage, they're paying for the use, and all of a sudden, you know, they they haven't even brought this up to uh, to the civic center because the civic center was basically what said here. You, here's your notice, you're no longer having storage after May. So I'm bringing this up because I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong that the that this, that we're basically saying, no, we don't have storage for you. This is a gymnastics club. Why do we not have storage for a gymnastics club at a civic center? It's ridiculous. And, and I'm sure that I could walk through that building and give you 10 different spots that we could build something. And I'd be quite willing to go down there and help, uh, which obviously, you know, that wouldn't be happening. But, um, um, you know, these people are volunteers. They go there every Sunday and they set up this operation. They they go like parents that are on the committee. They go down there and they set up all of this equipment every Sunday so that for eight hours that it gets rented every Sunday, people are using this equipment. Now if they go somewhere else, that's it, I think they're paying for something like twelve hours every week. Of, of, of our civic center, plus they're paying for storage. So we're gonna lose out all that revenue because we can't provide them storage. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, for, you know, the, the, the uh, staff is currently using about 70 square feet of that closet. I'm pretty sure I could find a seven by 10 room in that civic center somewhere that we can put that other stuff in. Uh, this is not acceptable in my eyes and the, the city staff needs to look at this uh, and talk to the civic center because this is, they may move out. They may find another location. The chances of that are probably, in my eyes, are pretty slim just because they need a big space and big space costs big money and realistically this group will probably not be able to afford it. So we need to keep supporting them and supporting these people that are putting in all their time and energy on their day off, setting this up so that our kids can enjoy gymnastics. We don't need to push them out the door and I really need this dealt with. Uh. I agree 100%. This is the first time I've heard it's this bad. But uh, 
what I think we should do is we've got a Recreation Commission meeting coming up here in the next week, and this will be brought forward to that. And what I would like is if uh, Councillor Miss could get somebody to come to that meeting and express their concerns. You know, like, uh, I, I see no reason why they can't be accommodated in any way. It's, uh, you know, they're, they're residents of the city, they pay taxes, their taxes run that building, and it's a, a club that is growing in size monthly, and it needs to be accommodated. It's, it, it's uh, you know, I, I've seen little cubby holes there, washrooms that are no longer used, it could be torn out or, or revamped so they can. I know the rec center has a lot of structural problems. It's, it's got a lot of housekeeping to do, but uh, doing that housekeeping by not giving people access to the facility is another problem. So I really think that this should, if we could get, I would, if somebody from the gymnastics club can get a hold of me because I sit on the recreation committee, I would definitely have them come to the meeting and we would we would address it and get get right to the bottom and you know uh, I believe Lee sits on the commission whenever he can get to it and he's been to most of the meetings so and Govinder would be there also so it's something that we can address you know like it's it's not something that uh, should be just sort of swept under the carpet it should be something that should be addressed and addressed as soon as possible because uh, I know they've brought out a new policy for renting but if they're paying then let's take care of them. They're a customer. They're a client. Yeah. yeah, I think the commission would be the best way to go for that. So if you could let them know to come, and recreation director will be there plus the commission. So it's probably the best avenue because that's who we would be probably talking to anyway. So, okay, yeah. I, I just want to point out that this was brought up by me only because I was in the situation where, you know, I was brought, this was brought forward to me as a, as my business and they said, you know, they were, you know, asking for my help and my uh, information from that perspective and I was the one that started asking the questions. So, you know, I was the one that was thinking outside of the box as far as, you know, there's something else that can be done uh, to help these people, and this is this isn't them coming to me as a counselor complaining about it. They were just going to move on. They're just going to move on to another location, and and well, you know, and it's because here you go. There's your storage. Go, you know, we you don't get storage anymore. Go away, you know. And and in my eyes, that's not how we want to operate. We want the civic center to be. Uh, we already know we lose enough money as it is, um, and you know, to lose a client that's renting it once a week for many hours I mean that you know that to me is uh, is is I mean they may choose to go in the end anyways but in the meantime that's money in our pocket uh, and like I said realistically for them to find a, a, a proper space for the gymnastic club it's going to be a tough battle so really I see us trying to support them for a long time to one other point that I this is this is how it was put to me they were actually recommended by the city staff uh, at the Civic Center to or, to buy a trailer and tow their stuff back and forth once a week. Uh, that is not acceptable in my eyes. So we will definitely need to take care of this. And like you said, so when is your meeting, Barry? It's the last, week, uh, last Wednesday of the month. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Sorry, last, <laughs> last Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay, other... Councilor Randhauer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, lots of people nearly approaching, like especially people traveling from Prince George to this end. Like gas price is highest in this area. Like some people are paying Prince George 90 cents, and maximum uh, like Terrace one dollar. So we are the highest paying gas price. So is, what's the reason they asking me? So I don't know like why it's like freight charge extra or taxes in Prince Rupert. So I don't know what's the answer. So maybe our manager can help me that. That's a difficult one to, to ask for because in many ways they have complete control over what the prices are, right? We, we can't set bylaws to do anything like that. So that's a, that's a difficult one. I mean, I can ask around too if you'd like to figure it out, but uh, I I have seen the discrepancy myself as well. Councillor Cunningham. One thing, you know, we were talking about money, raising money and everything else. A while back, I think it was around April, Councillor Moreau brought up a thing called a revenue growth strategy, 
Whatever happened with that? I think, yeah, I think that part of the strategy is basically to, to not talk about it. No, no. <laughs> I mean, to figure out how we're going to make money, right? Yeah, but I it mean, was, it was selling the rights to the uh, arena, to naming the arena, things like that. You know, like, uh, you know, it was, it was just thinking out of the box about ways to raise money, you know. Call City Hall the Rogers Center or something, but <laughs> no, we don't want that. The Canucks are losing. I think it's but more about <laughs> embedding the culture of everything we do has the thought about creating revenue for the city. The marina, other things like that. Things that are going to bring in extra revenue, passing developments, things like that. I think it's more about embedding a culture of everything we're going to do needs to start thinking about how we're going to make money doing those things rather than just spending money. So that, I think, was support, started the intention. And then maybe also coming up with some specifics, ideas. And I don't think we ever really made it that far at that point. But uh, the, the CFO and I have had a couple of conversations with the city manager as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of a living document. There's so many ideas out there, but how many can you pursue at any one time? Um, and so, in particular, the naming rights, it's, it's something that, you know, we need to go to tender and we need to do an RFP. And so for us, it's, it, as the mayor said, it's trying to embed a culture of entrepreneurialism in, in local government, right? We want to be creative in the way that we can raise money based on the unique challenges that, that Prince Rupert faces. I just thought I'd bring it up because it's been April since we discussed it and there's been no discussion about it. Well, then if we want, we can try to get something together, but, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and the other thing is the business committee we were going to start, I know we... That's on the 25th. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's on the 25th. The small business task force that Councilor Morrell has put forward, yeah, that's on the agenda. For, no, we made sure that, because we had a, such a loaded agenda at our last December one to move it to here, but that's underway for sure. I just like reminding the young guys of things because they always remind the old. <laughs> other uh, questions or any reports from council? Okay, no. I'd just like to quickly report out. I know I don't want to delay it any further, but uh, that uh, council staff attended a placemaking workshop uh, this weekend. Uh, two individuals from a place called City, or an organization called City Repair, uh, came up from Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, one of their audience attendants tonight. Uh, Shelly Starr was in attendance as well, one of the neighborhood residents of McKay Street. Uh, basically came up and to showcase all the innovations that are happening in the city of Portland. Uh, they're well ahead of the game in terms of neighborhood redesigns, public space redesign, and policies that encourage uh, community engagement, those type of things. So it was a very uh, you know, inspiring weekend. We had almost a couple hundred residents come to a Friday night talk at the Lester Center. Uh, about 45 residents, city staff, city council attended the workshop where we entered into design charrettes around McKay Street Park to look at what the potential of that, that site could look like, other neighborhood redesigns, ideas about getting things started, and basically to start the process of redesigning the communities from the bottom up, neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, there's so many good content came out of that. And so today I'd actually like to put a, a notice of motion for the next council meeting. Uh, for us to start a 2030 Sustainable City Policy Working Group that would start to discuss policies around placemaking, uh, green uh, policies like uh, renewable energy, local food production, social enterprises, those types of things, as well as some of the things that Councillor Moreau uh, had learnt for the Cities Fit for Children conference. And really, if we're going to get the policy group together, that's going to be doing the OCP affordable housing and the planning for major projects, I'd like to time it so that if we're going to do a major update on our bylaws and things like that, that some of these other policies for our 2030 city, sustainable city um, come in with that as well. Because there's a whole bunch of things we can be doing around community composting, uh, you know, backyard hens that like Terrace is doing, and uh, you know, zero waste strategies, and all these kind of things that would make the sound a much more sustainable community. And I'd like to get a working group so I could bring a, I'm just putting a notice of motion to bring a terms of reference for council for the next, uh, for the next meeting. Because uh, I think that's definitely something we should be getting on to get that part of the vision of Hayes 2.0 uh, mapped out more. And the last thing is I encourage residents to look at uh, 
our city results from 2015. Uh, we published this on the website, and if we haven't, we'll publish it tomorrow. Um, and it's a, the list of all the things that city council and staff have accomplished for the community last year. It's quite an extensive list. We've been working very hard at getting this community moving forward, and so that there's a lot of action behind the words that we speak here. And I'm very proud of all the work we've been doing in just one year of office. And I know that this year we're going to be doing even more work. And uh, I'm very proud of all the work our staff and council has been doing for the community and working with and, you know, establishing new relationships with First Nations, the province. Uh, we're really starting to get some traction on many fronts. And uh, it's, it's, 2015 was a great year, and we really hope 2016 is an even better year. So that being said, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councilor Cunningham, seconded by Councilor Nish. All those in favor? Meetings adjourned. Good evening.